And uh, we've, so far over the last uh, six or seven weeks, or actually in the last five weeks, I guess, we've, uh, we've talked about creating a culture for the anointing. We've talked about gifts of healing and the healing anointing. We've talked about releasing the virtue of Jesus and how to release power when you pray. We've talked about the word of knowledge, the word of faith, the prayer of faith, authority in the name of Jesus, and uh, the gift of faith and the working of miracles. That was last week. Tonight, we're going to talk about deliverance and the deaf and dumb spirit. Next week, we're gonna finish up by talking about partnering with the power of the Lord that is present to heal and how to recognize when an atmospheric anointing and atmospheric grace comes into the room. And it's not just into a, into a church setting, but I wanna tell you the power of the Lord is often present to heal right there on your job, right there in the grocery store. Wherever you are, God is wanting to move. And one of the things I wanna teach you is how to be aware of the specific presence and power of the Lord that brings healing with it. We're also gonna be talking, we're gonna be spending the bulk of our time next week talking about partnering with the angelic and the role of angels in healing ministry as well as the power of testimony. But tonight we're talking about deliverance and the deaf and dumb spirit. And, um, and so, hey, who's ready to get delivered tonight? Amen. And, uh, you know, if you're smart, you say, if I got it, I don't want to have it. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, whatever you're willing to hide, you're willing to keep. And so sometimes you just got to jump in the prayer line just to make sure you're all right. And um, those of you who are watching, even as Pastor Jeff uh, said, we just believe that what is happening here can happen right there. Um, you know, it's interesting. Our, our, our prophetic ministry school, has, it's already going all around the world, and it's getting blasted all over the place. And that thing just picked up like wildfire. And uh, people are wanting to do the same thing with our healing school as well. And I believe that actually is a, is, is kind of speaks to what we're supposed to be doing here in this location with the Regional School of Ministry and really seeing this place become the Apostolic Equipping and Training Center it's called to be. And speaking of apostolic training and equipping, our good friend Maurice is here tonight. Come on, let's thank the Lord for him. Hallelujah. My brother for another mother. Hallelujah. Come on, stand up and let everybody see how much we look alike. Amen. And uh, come on. We love you guys and love what you're doing. So... Let's jump in. I told Jeff and Jody this morning, I felt the Mr. Kool-Aid anointing come on me. I came in this morning and started preparing. I felt like I could run through a wall. Remember Kool-Aid man? Like, ba-bam! You know? It's like a cross between Kool-Aid man and Fat Albert, because every time I feel I'm like, hey, hey, hey. So, Holy Ghost bombs away. Key Bible verses for tonight. Amen? And uh, I'm still in the afterglow of this past Sunday. You know, I'm still kind of glory to glory drafting with what the Lord did this past Sunday in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And um, listen, I'm telling you, you're not, supposed to, you're not supposed to come into a great moment in God and then come out. It's glory to glory. And so the deeper you go, the deeper you be. Amen. And so the truth is, is the more we experience in God, it shouldn't be that we all of a sudden have this great encounter and then all of a sudden we back up into a woe is me position. But we have these great encounters and all of a sudden it's like, boom, we're shutting a door. The line has been drawn. We're not going back any further than where we are right now. We're only going forward. Amen. It may have been fall back, but it's time to spring forward. Hallelujah. Amen. So everybody have your workbook. If you do not have your workbook tonight, we do have them to my left and to my right. And uh, let's go ahead and start looking at our key Bible verses. Number one, Psalm 107 20, it says that God sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. See, when God releases his word, it brings healing and it brings deliverance. Matthew chapter 8, verses, verse 16 says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Notice he, he, he didn't cast them out with a three hour counseling session. Amen. There wasn't 21 questions to a better Tuesday. He cast them out with a word. And one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is how to, how to minister deliverance with a word. Because when you begin to bind the strong man, you can plunder his house. Because when you bind the strong man, the stronghold begins to crumble. And so what Jesus did, he was able to go into a region and recognize a strong man principality that oftentimes was operating not just in a region, but through certain people. And he would begin to not just address the fruit. A lot of times in the church, we're just trying to pastor back the fruit. Instead, he would come in and he would address the strong man. He would bind the strong man. And when you bind the strong man, you can only plunder his house, but that's what brings citywide transformation and awakening. Because all of a sudden, when that principality and that demonic rule loses its power, when it loses its seat of authority, all of a sudden, what appeared to be a closed heaven is now open. Amen? 
So Matthew 8, 16, again, when evening had, I love this scripture, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. Now, what's interesting here is they brought to him many and he cast out the spirits with a word. And so he didn't go to each and every person, giving each and every person a different word. He had a word that set an entire region free. Do you feel what just came in the room? He had a word that was a key that unlocked the darkness that had held an entire region captive. And when he spoke that word, it released light into the atmosphere and all were healed. And see, honestly, a lot of times warfare is simply a house of cards. If you pull one card, it all crumbles. And so when you're praying for people and when we have an opportunity to minister tonight and in the days and weeks ahead, and when you take this, listen, the, the, this, this ministry of deliverance, it is, it is not supposed to just rest in the church. I wanna tell you, the river gets, gets deeper the further you get from this place. I thank God for the river. I thank God for the well. I thank God for the pool. But at the same time, I recognize that there is a whole lot more hurting people out there than we'll ever get in here. Amen. And my goal is not just to try to get them in here, but my goal is to try to get as many of us here out there to them. Amen. Because you have an opportunity to touch and impact people in a way in their natural setting that we may, may or may not ever have an opportunity to do here. Amen. And so I think a lot of times we've had the whole thing backwards. We've had a church mindset when we need to have a kingdom mindset. Amen. The church mindset says, come to us. Kingdom says, what you want, baby, I got it. Amen. And go to them. Amen. Jesus said the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. It doesn't come just by coming on a Sunday morning and sitting there and letting everybody do the stuff. We thank God for those moments. We thank God for those opportunities to encounter the goodness of God and to celebrate what God is doing and to, to rally around these, these, these amazing uh, encounters like we had this past Sunday. But he said, no, the kingdom of God is not limited to those expressions. The kingdom of God is within you. And I want to tell you, the kingdom of God wants out. Amen. In fact, I would like to tell you that many of you, because many of you have felt like you've been going through a season of shaking and it's not about what you've done wrong. It's about what God has done right. And he's about to do in and through you. And I want to tell you about a vision that I had back in 2003. It was, uh, no, 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 it was 2004, um, New Year's Eve, 2004. And, um, and I was praying, I was in a prayer meeting, an all night prayer meeting. And uh, that was back when we were a little religious. And, um, uh, But anyway, we were in an all-night prayer meeting on New Year's Eve. Hallelujah. Now we watch the ball drop. But in this prayer meeting, I saw the hand of the Lord come in and grab a can of Pepsi. And as the hand of the Lord came in and grabbed this can of Pepsi, he began to shake it. And I'm going, oh, it's going to get messy. And the Lord said, that's the point. And I saw the other hand come down. And here's the thing is, I saw it was the finger and the thumb. How many know that's the prophetic and the apostolic working together? And then when the prophetic and the apostolic came down and they uncapped, when they uncapped what was holding back what was on the inside, all of a sudden I saw all of these people who had gathered around to watch the shaking. And how many of you know there's a lot of people that are watching the shakings in the world around us right now? But they gathered to watch the shaking. And as the hand of the Lord began to shake this thing and the prophetic and the apostolic began to work together and open this thing up, what was on the inside got on the outside. And guess what? What was on the inside got all over them. Now, if I was to come down here and shake up a can of Pepsi with Greta and Hope. And by the way, I am loving that sweater. Is that a cardigan? Hallelujah. Whatever it is, it is amazing. I love that orange. Amen. But if I was to come here and shake up a can of Pepsi and I pop the top, amen, what would happen? It would get all over them. And guess what? Then where would they go? They would go into their closet and change. They would go into a place of transformation. They would go into a secret place. They would go into that place and begin to put off the old thing and put on the new thing. They begin to put off the spirit of heaviness and put on the garment of praise. Because I'm telling you, what's on the, when, what is on the inside of you breaks out and begins to get on the lives of those around you, it requires a choice to be made. It requires either a change or you're just going to stay the way you were. Amen. I don't know about you, but I was made for change. 
And I'm telling you, a lot of what's happening in the world right now and what's perceived as shaking is simply to create an attraction in the world to come to those who have the kingdom of God on the inside. That when you're at work, you're not just listening at the water cooler about what Facebook says about that and what uh, the news says about this. But you can begin to step up and say, listen, I've got a better report. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not, I'm not preaching Fox News. I'm not preaching CNN. I'm preaching the good news. Amen. I'm preaching that, listen, if our eye is single, our whole body be full of light. And there's so much distraction in the world that is creating distortion that it is causing the body of Christ to forget the great treasure that we've been given in these earthen vessels. Amen. And I asked the Lord, I said, God, because I was kind of a, a Diet Coke guy. Amen. I said, Lord, why Pepsi? He said, and this is back when their slogan was the choice of the new generation. He said, I'm beginning to uncap my kingdom in a way that it's going to capture the heart of the new generation because the millennials don't want church the way church has been done, but they want a God who is real, a God who is raw, and a God who's going to meet them where they're at and create in them a desire for transformation. Father, I thank you, Lord, right now, Lord, for the the choice of the new generation, that what is on the inside would get on the outside. Father, I thank you that you're shaking everything that can be shaken, God, so that the kingdom of God would go forth in power in Jesus' name. God, I ask, Lord, that what is on the inside of us, Lord, Lord, if there's anything on the inside that needs to go, get it gone tonight in Jesus' name. But Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, what you've placed on the inside, that seed of divine destiny, the kingdom of God on the inside God we ask for a just a a dynamic explosion of the glory of God what would happen if the body of Christ went viral what if how man listen what if there was a holy ghost outbreak Amen. What if somebody caught what you were carrying? Amen. See, a lot of times we're so concerned about, you know, shaking this person's hand and shaking that person's hand and and hanitize this and hanitize that. That's when you put hand sanitizer together is one word. Amen. Abel Watley taught me that one. Hanitizer. So we're so, so often we're scared of the germs in the world around us. And I want to tell you that is a, unfortunately a very pathetic pr- picture of the body of Christ that we have more faith in the world's ability to cause us to stumble than in our ability to cause them to rise up. And oftentimes what happens, we create distance from someone who, who maybe their liberty could cause us to stumble or maybe their sin could cause us to slip. Listen, if that's the case, you've got a weak gospel and you may need to get born again. If someone else who is in darkness, is currently walking in darkness, is going to cause you to stumble, you may not yet know Jesus, but I will introduce him to you tonight. Because the gospel sets you free. Amen? And a lot of what has happened within church is we've just created a system of, like these IV system, where we're just trying to get our daily devotional so we don't kill our dog. Or snap at our wife, or do whatever it is. Amen? When what we need is transformation. Amen. Amen. I better hurry. We've only got through the second scripture. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. I'm trying to get done early tonight because that spirit of Jimmy John's is knocking at my door. Amen. (laughs) Jesus. Hallelujah. We didn't even eat there the other day. I just had to stop in and say, hey. (laughs) Pastor Judy and I, we had a meeting at Zoe's. We were meeting with the Lemmys and talking about connect groups and all this kind of stuff. I said, hold on. Let me just go over and say hi to Jimmy John's. I was like, hey. And they're like, oh, Pastor Jason. So, amen. All right, next scripture. God, I, listen, I'm telling you, there is so much revelation in Matthew 8, 16. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick. God, we ask you for the word to release regional transformation and deliverance from darkness where the yoke of bondage would be broken. And Lord, not only the heavens would be wide open, but sons and daughters would walk as liberated children of God, delivering creation from corruption that, is, that has been bound by the lusts of this world. You know, it says in Romans chapter 8 that all of creation is groaning for the sons of God to be made manifest, that that creation could be delivered from corruption and come into the liberty that you and I know as sons and daughters of God. Amen. What are you doing to liberate creation? What if every day we just say, you know, I'm going to do one thing today to liberate the creation that I've been entrusted to? 
Shiki de Baba. <laughs> Amen. Feel that Kool-Aid anointing coming on. You watch out when the fat Albert kicks in. Hey, 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 next scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house which has eyes to see but does not see and ears to hear but does not hear for they are a rebellious house. Okay? And so how many of you ever, you know, you, you've seen somebody who, who they, they could see it but they couldn't see it. They could hear it but they couldn't hear it. And they chose in their heart to rebel against what God is saying. Our, our, our last key Bible verse, and then we'll jump into lesson of objectives. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23 says, For rebellion, again, he was talking about the rebellious house is he who hears and doesn't hear, sees and doesn't see. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. So, Again, rebellion is, is, is just is simplified here. Rebellion is in rejecting the word of the Lord. You see it right there. Rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. When you reject the word of the Lord in your life, that honestly is no less wicked than someone actively engaging in occultic activity. It'll actually invite, and honestly, to me, because you see, some people are in darkness because they don't even know about the light. But when we know about the light, we choose to resist the light, we choose to reject the word of the Lord in our life, that is intentional obstinance, saying, I know I'm supposed to, get, I know I'm supposed to do this, but I'm going to choose to do that. And that stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Amen? But we're going to have an opportunity to repent tonight. Lesson objectives. We're going to learn about the role of deliverance and healing ministry We're going to look at types of sickness. Again, this is just an introductory list of types of sickness that are often connected to a need for deliverance. We're going to talk about knowing your authority in Christ. We're going to understand what it means to bind the strong man. How many of you have heard about binding the strong man? Now, how many of you had no idea what that meant? Okay, awesome. I'm I'm going to teach you tonight. We're going to look at what does it look like to fill the house I mean, Jesus said in Matthew 12, when an unclean spirit leaves, it goes through dry places. And then when it comes back and finds the house swept and put in order, if the house is not filled, he brings seven of his most evil friends along with him and then reoccupies the place. Amen. How many of you ever heard about that? And so you're like, oh my God, how do I fill the house? I know something left. How do I get the right stuff in so the bad stuff doesn't come back? We're going to talk about that tonight. Also, we're going to see how the stronghold of unbelief and the deaf and dumb spirit work together. And then we're going to pray for everybody. Types of sickness often connected to the need for deliverance. Number one is infirmity. A spirit of infirmity. Luke chapter 13, verses 10 and 11 is your scripture there. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. One of the things about a spirit of infirmity is it actually opens the doors to other sickness. And when someone embraces a spirit of infirmity, there's this crazy belief going around sometimes where sometimes people actually believe that God gave them a sickness to either teach them a lesson or to somehow be glorified. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God is a good God. He does not put sickness on his children. Listen, sickness is of the devil. Healing is of God. End of story. There is no but. There is no excuse to that. And see, when someone actually, because, and you see this actually in John chapter 5, when Jesus asked the man at the pool of Bethesda who had a spirit of infirmity for 38 years, he says, do you want to be made well? Because what happened was he had been so, uh, he so identified with his infirmity, he didn't even have the clarity of mind to answer the right question. He said, do you want to be made well? He goes, there's nobody to put me in the pool. He didn't even ask him that question. And that shows me he was conditioned by his infirmity to create excuses in the the moment of opportunity. The only thing worse than giving an excuse is receiving an excuse. When people give you excuses in their life, you need to love them enough to call it out and say, that's crap. 
When people began to start, listen, because you, you, listen, you may be the only Jesus they see that day. You may be the only gardener that has the, the roundup to begin to, to lay waste to the tares and the miracle grow to see the seed come forth. And so you need to say, listen, you can be crazy on somebody else's watch, but you ain't going to be stupid on mine. Amen? Hallelujah. She get it, Baba. Number two, epilepsy. We're going to talk about that tonight. Three, depression. Okay? Another type of sickness would be depression. Isaiah 10, 27, which we're going to be looking at, of course, says, it says it will come to pass in that day that the yoke will be removed, the burn will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Also, Isaiah 61, verse 3, Pastor Jeff actually read from that earlier, that we would give the, the, the oil of joy for the spirit of mourning. We would give the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that we would be able to console those who mourn. We'd be able to, to, to appoint and ordain those who have, who have had hardship happen in their life, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Amen. We talked about that this past week. We talked about the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that oftentimes the Lord uses the most broken to rebuild the ruined places. You see this in Isaiah 61. Part of the purpose of the anointing is to rebuild cities. Redeem people, rebuild cities. Redeemed people, rebuild cities. Amen? How many of you have been redeemed of the Lord? Come on. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Listen, he didn't, he didn't redeem you just so you could have a, a, a higher quality of life. He didn't redeem you just so you could go to heaven. He redeemed you so that you could release the influence and the impact of heaven and the earth that you've been entrusted to. Mute. It's another sickness. Matthew 9, 32 through 33. It says, and they went out. Behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. We're going to talk about that too. Because the thing about the religious spirit is it always seeks to find fault with people who walk in power. There was a, there was a man who was mute. Okay, he, Listen, this, this, poor, this, poor, this poor guy, he, not only was, was he mute, but he was also demon-possessed. He was bound. And I don't know if you guys remember the, the girl who, uh, I think she was 32, 33, 34 years, who was, she was born deaf. And she, I can't remember how old she was, but she was born deaf and mute. And the Lord healed her, but he healed her through deliverance. And we, we cast the devil out of her in the baptismal. I think we showed a video of it and stuff like that. And remember the guy who had brought her began to weep because he didn't even know her name because she had never been able to tell her name. And, um, but it had happened through deliverance. Her ear was open and her mouth began to speak. And the first thing that her mouth had ever said in that 32, 33, 34 years was the name Jesus. Because the first thing she heard was Jesus. And so the first thing that went in was the first thing that came out. Come on, Jesus. And the Pharisees, so here's a guy who's mute, he's demon possessed. That was, a, that was a problem. Jesus heals the man, and the Pharisees seek to find fault with him because he walked in power. Why? Because their livelihood was connected to this man's sickness and his dependence on the church. How many in a religious system have created a system where they use people to build their ministry and not ministry to build people? And if we really get people liberated and free, their cookie will crumble. Anyway. Blindness. Blindness. Matthew 12, 22. We're going to talk about that again tonight. And, and, and blindness, that's an example we're going to look at in depth later. Okay, so listen. Blindness is a type of sickness that can often be connected to a need for deliverance. But at the same time, what I don't want you to do is create a formula. Say, oh, you got this? You got a devil. Because if you'll notice, I put often connected with. Okay? While it could be a need for deliverance, it is not always. An example would be John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? See, his disciples had been conditioned by, they had been previously conditioned by a religious spirit to seek to find fault if something was wrong with someone. Who sinned, him or his parents? He was born blind. This is what Jesus said, neither. Jesus answered them and said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And so while these types of sickness can often be connected to a need for deliverance, don't make a hard and fast rule. You've got to know the voice of the Spirit of God in your life. 
You gotta be able to hear when he says, okay, this is the devil that needs to be cast out. This is simply somewhere you need to pray a prayer of faith or there's a word of knowledge and word of wisdom to be released to bring, bring the miraculous into play. Amen? Deaf and dumb spirit. The blank there is dumb. Deaf and dumb spirit. And again, the word dumb there was just mute, okay? And we're going to talk about how that was originally translated and, 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 and how it is active and operating today. And it is a broad spectrum. There is a broad spectrum. There's extreme cases and less, less extreme. And so one thing, I, one thing I really want to just put out there and caution is if you have any of these symptoms that I talked tonight... This is not to bring you under a label of what you've walked in or under. This is to remove the label. The gospel does not reveal your sin. It removes your sin. Amen? And so what we're going to do tonight, listen, so don't be like, oh, I don't want to say I've got a deaf and dumb spirit because I, you know, I don't want anybody to think I'm dumb. What you do is, you know what? I've got some effects of that, and I don't care what you call it. As long as you don't call me late for dinner, I'm going to get it. Amen? Amen. Because here's the thing is, I would rather be free than, than care about what this person or that person thinks. Because a lot of times what keeps us bound is the fear of man. Okay? Sooner or later, you're going to come to the point where you just don't care what other people think. Amen? It's a wonderful place to be. So, lastly, simply general sickness. General sickness. Acts 10.38 is your, your, your scripture there. It says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. He went about healing all who are oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Now listen, I want to give you a word of, word of balance, a word of wisdom, okay? Now, while we recognize that these are types of sickness that often are connected to a need for deliverance, I also want you to realize that we live in a fallen world with natural bodies, some sickness can be related to diet. Some sickness can be related to sin. Some can be related to your surroundings, possibly even your immune system, and even some are related to demonic oppression and manifestation. What you don't want to do is apply one principle across the board and say, if it's this, it's got to be that, because that removes the most important part of the equation, the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen? For some of you, you're... you're the, the pathway to healing may be a prayer of faith. For somebody else, it may be cutting sugar out of your diet. Don't try to send that back my way. I, I saw you try to... <laughs> Edgar's is coming to trust I, Hallelujah. But I'm serious. The Holy Spirit, listen... He'll heal through the laying on of hands. He'll heal through the word of knowledge. He'll heal through medical doctors and surgeons. That is no less of a healing or miracle. Amen. He'll heal. Just as Pastor Jeff said, the, the storing up wisdom for the upright. Honestly, because what is, what is the greater healing or the miracle? To get healed instantaneous or to actually be able to own the ground of your healing that you've occupied? You see, with the children of Israel, the, the Lord drove out their enemies bit by bit so they could maintain the promise. And I've seen a lot of people get instantaneous miracles and breakthrough. But I'll tell you, not everyone who got that instantaneous breakthrough hung on to it because some of them did not appreciate what they had because it came too easy. Amen? Listen that's, why, listen, that's why, you know, we talk about debt cancellation, and I love when it's supernatural. I love when the Lord just cancels debt and things are forgiven. But I'll tell you, I actually feel, a high, I feel that a higher level form of debt cancellation is when the Lord gives you a creative solution to work your finances and to steward his resources in your life in a way that rightly represents him, not only provides for your needs, but also empowers you to be a blessing. Because guess what? Then you grow in authority and likeness of God in the process. And you're, no, you're not not just a hireling looking for a handout, but you're a son who can be entrusted with the fullness of his father's house. And it takes us from saying what God can do for us to instead saying, you know what? God and I together, we can do a lot. We can change the world. Amen? One is a, ch one is a child, the other is a son. We don't have time to get into that. It's not our, our message for tonight. We'll do it later. So, all authority. All authority. Matthew chapter 28, verses, verse 18 Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So the blank there is all. I just want to ask you a question. If Jesus has all authority, then what does the devil have? None. The next blank is none. 
If Jesus has all authority, authority, then the devil has none. And guess what? When Jesus comes to live in your heart, he brings his authority with him. There's authority in the name of Jesus. There's authority in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood. Amen? Power in the blood. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, loving not our lives unto death and the word of our testimony. We're going to be talking about that in depth next week. But also I want, to look at, I want you to see the power that he's given you over the enemy. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. It says, then the 70 returned with joy, saying, now listen, this is, bef- this is before Jesus died. This is before he was resurrected. This is before he sent the Holy Spirit back into the earth. This is simply Jesus walk. They're still living under an old covenant, even though the new covenant is in their midst. So it says that the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The word subject to us simply means even the demons have to obey. Do you know that demons have to obey you? Demons have to obey you. Demons have to obey you. They are a lesser subject. You have a higher place of authority. In fact, the angels were created a little less than you. So when you step up and you begin to tell those devils what to do in the name of Jesus with the authority that he has, they have to do it. Now, they may kick and scream a little bit, but you say, no, shut up. I bind you in the name of Jesus. Sometimes you can throw a little shut up in the name of Jesus on you. I've done that a couple times, haven't I, Jeff? (laughs) Hallelujah. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan. Listen what happened. He sent out these 70 guys on a field trip. And he said, while you are out doing what I've done, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out devils, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in it. And what he was saying is saying, guys, listen, don't major on a minor. These guys came back, and because they had one demonstration of power, they wanted to create a whole deliverance ministry. And I see this happen a lot in the body of Christ. People experience a certain level of success in one area of ministry, and they all of a sudden say, bam, this is it. This is everything. And, when they, and they don't recognize, no, that is a part of a much bigger piece. And I want to tell you, as a word of caution and a word of wisdom, whenever you major on a minor, you have opened up the door to error. Whenever, listen, one of, the, one of the issues, I've not seen many people come out of deliver, deliverance ministries delivered. Because you become what you behold. And if you spend all your time focused on the devil, guess what? Guess whose image you're being formed in? And you're actually creating a system of codependency and not a system of interdependence. Just put that out there. Binding the strong man. Binding the strong man. Some of you tonight are actually going to begin to feel different manifestations in your body um, as some of these strong men are identified and they begin to loose their hold. In fact, some of you are feeling even a a pressure on the right side of your neck and into your shoulder. Uh, The Lord's going to remove the yoke. He's going to destroy the burden. Somebody else, you're feeling a real uneasiness, kind of like over in here. I think that's kind of like where the pancreas is. But but, um, but there's how many of you are are feeling things happening even in your physical body as we're talking? That's amazing. What's happening is those demonic forces and those strongholds are being loosened up right now. It's kind of like when you go to uproot a tree, you can either cut it off. And a lot of what we do is just cut off things and leave the root and leave the stump, you know? But we're, we're not just going to grind the stump. What we're doing here is we're systematically, spiritually loosening up the soil of your circumstance so where the root belief in the strong man can be uprooted so we can plant something brand new in your garden. So let's talk about binding the strong man. 
Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 30. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind, and mute. That's a full meal deal. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And he healed him. He healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Hallelujah. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Why? Because the people were looking for a savior. Let me just say this. People want to believe. People want to believe. But watch how the religious spirit steps up. Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Listen, if the Pharisees had a Facebook page, I don't want to tell you, lots of them do. I've thought about doing, you know, like the Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a redneck F. I've wanted to do like, you might be a Pharisee if you might have a religious spirit. Wouldn't that be fun? You know, I've got a list I've been working on. I just don't want anybody to feel it hits home for them, but... If the shoe fits, kick it off and buy some flip-flops. This fellow, does not, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the rule of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts, the blank there is new, and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. The blank there is divided. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will this kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Before, therefore, they shall be your judges. So what he was saying is, hey, listen. This generation, and we're going to look at this in Mark chapter 9. What he was doing, he was speaking to a generation of unbelief. And oftentimes what you see is there's a, ge- there's a generation of unbelief that is connected to geographical possession and oppression. And oftentimes it takes a generation to invite in a principality and a generation to drive out the principality. But guess what? We are the generation that will drive it out. I'm going to talk about this to- I'm going to talk about it tonight. When Jesus identified the man, the, the, the father who had the young boy, who had the deaf and dumb spirit, before he ever addressed the father, he addressed the faithless generation. And what he was saying is, there was a generation that opened spiritual gates to invite something in that was never meant to be here. He goes on in verse 28. He says, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come near you. It says, or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Plunder. Plunder. Now, Mark chapter 3, verse 27, it gives us another perspective of this. It says, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Let me give you a a scriptural example, a biblical example of what what it looks like to identify and bind the strong man. Now, again, oftentimes we're talking about, and we're looking at Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, okay? There are, you know, there are, there are principalities, there are powers, there are rulers of darkness that we, we wrestle against. But guess what? Oftentimes, they work through people who have aligned with their influence in their life. Okay? And so here's an example. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. It says, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him... Out of the, when he came out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains. And so you see, and you can see this, you can see this in several different personality types, even in the, in the Old Testament. But what we see here is there's actually a ruling spirit named Legion that had found a home within the heart of this man. It was not just the demons, but the demons were actually an influence of a principality that was a work in a geographical region. 
And it says, no one could bind him even with chains because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken into pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Okay. This is again, where even that self-sabotage and that cutting spirit comes from. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. And see, as bound as this man was, he still desired Jesus. His response was worship. Even though he had this, this I mean, listen, he was a mega church in and of himself waiting to happen. I've met a couple of people who were home groups, but this guy had a mega church going on inside of him about to happen. Amen. It says, he cried out with a loud voice, said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Verse eight, for he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? Come out of him. What is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion for we are many. Get this. My name is Legion for we are many. Why? Because Legion was the strong man. Legion was the strong man for we are many. And when Jesus could identify, how many of you felt the anointing come on your neck right then when we said that? Okay. How many of you were having pain in your neck and in your shoulders? And then all of a sudden when I said that pain left. Okay. Amen. So he said, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly saying that he would not send him out of the out of the country. Why? Because he had been active and operating in that place for a long time. He had been granted access. There had been generations that had embraced and had made more room for more of the devil in their life. And what they probably said is as long as he doesn't mess with me and mine, He can do what he wants. For too long, the church has had that response to darkness. As long as I I turn my alarm on every night and it don't come in my door, I'm okay. You can go down there, you can shoot people up, smoke crack, do what you want, but just don't come in my neighborhood. Could it be that we've allowed things to be active and operating within our sphere of influence, our authority, and in our understanding? Because as long as it didn't inconvenience us, we were okay with what was happening in the world around us. The kingdom of God will not increase unless you begin to start enlarging the place of your tent, enlarging the place of your understanding, and recognizing that the brightness of your light is called to shine bright. Amen? So he goes on, and he says, He begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Jesus, in other words, they could not do without Jesus giving them permission. How, you know, sometimes people have been scared that a devil's going to jump out of this person and jump in that person. Have you all ever heard that? Listen, I've heard people, I, I've heard people say, you know, you got to be careful who you pray for and who prays for you because you might catch a devil. Only, listen, only if there's something on the inside of you that's wanting a devil. Listen, if you've got, a, if you've got a, an empty place, that void place, that empty place in you that is pulling at darkness, you might catch something you want. It's called a familiar spirit. And so you don't ever have to, listen, you don't ever have to be scared of praying for anybody because of what you may catch. And let me tell you this, if you find yourself afraid in that situation, you recognize, you know what? I have through fear empowered a familiar spirit and I've recognized that they're not the only ones that need to get free. I need to let freedom start with me. Fear opens the largest door to the demonic of anything. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Fear comes by hearing and hearing and listening to the enemy. So he goes on, says, all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that he may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, okay? And so there was at least 2,000 devils in this guy because there was 2,000 swine, okay? Again, my name is Legion, we are many. One strong man, at least 2,000 devils. 
So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once, Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out, entered the swine. There were about 2,000. The herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And when they went out to see what it was that had happened, they came to Jesus. They saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who, and they were afraid of the demoniac getting free. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from the region. Because some people would let, rather have the comfort of convenience. At least they knew, listen, that one guy, he's crazy, but we got this other thing worked out, hallelujah. And what happened was they recognized, well, listen, if he could change his life, what could he do to mine? And so do you think they wanted him to leave just because this man got free? Or you think it was the devils in them that said he better go before he calls out who we are too? And there's a lot of religious devils that are hiding behind a fence and accusation of people who are really getting free. They began to plead with him, depart from the region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he, is, and how he has had compassion on you. All right, so strong man. Let's talk about what it looks like to bind the strong man. The strong man in a situation, the strong man either in, in, in the life of a person, in a region, um, over a specific purpose or covenant call on a people, the strong man is the one who controls a specific stronghold. The strong man is one who controls a specific stronghold, a place or a territory under his influence. And we've all been to places like this to where you, you, you're... You're living, in one, you're living in one type of influence in one place, and then you step into another geographical region. And yes, you have an open heaven in your life, but when you step into another region, how many of you know you can notice the difference in their heaven? You can notice the difference in their atmosphere, what they're cultivating, okay? You see this a lot. Listen, it's, it's not as noticeable when you just kind of live locally, but the more you travel and you go different places, you'll, you'll, your feet will hit the ground, and you're like, ooh. A little tremor in the force, hallelujah. You begin to feel it. You begin to see it. Even the different counties and different cities in Alabama, it's very unique. When you go to different places and you begin to pick up on the regional strongholds and strongmen in those areas. But the problem is some of those strongmen and strongholds have been embraced by the religious community. So a stronghold, so again, a strong man is the one who controls a specific stronghold. It's a place of territory under his influence. So what is a stronghold? A stronghold is a house of thoughts. A stronghold is a house of thoughts. Francis Frangipane described uh, a stronghold as simply a house of thoughts. So if a, if a strong man is someone who has control over a stronghold, and a stronghold is a house of thoughts, then a strong man is a root belief that a house of thoughts is built on. A strong man is a root belief that a house of thoughts is built on. And again, it can be a regional a principality that manifests in a certain way, a certain lie for a certain person. We've all seen that. You go to certain, certain situations and what? There's a, there's a stronghold of poverty. Why? Because there's a strong man of fear. Because poverty is actually one of the many fruits of the, of the spirit of fear. Because poverty, doesn't ha poverty and prosperity don't have anything to do with what you have. It has everything to do with what has you. I know a lot of people who are rich who have a spirit of poverty because no matter how much they get, it'll never be enough. I know other people who, when you would look at their bank account, you would not call them rich, but they are prosperous because they are not living in bondage to mammon, but they recognize the resources they've been given have been to, as a stewardship here on the earth to see the kingdom of God increase in advance. Amen? So identifying the strong man is key in bringing down the stronghold, the stronghold. There was a, a young man here a couple weeks ago who got marvelously set free. 
got marvelously set free, got saved, got baptized. And it was because of binding the strong man. First, binding the strong man. And, and I, I, when I went up to pray for him, it was something, I mean, you couldn't, it, there was no natural sign of this, but the Lord, as soon as the Lord said, the spirit of the strong man of rage, bind the strong man of rage, and then guess what? The stronghold of murder and hate and anger and everything went with it. But really, it was a rage that was fueled by rejection. So it was a strong man that had gotten in, a strong man of rage that had been influenced by rejection. This door of rejection had given this thing access in his life and was manifesting in hatred, anger, and thoughts of murder. And then as soon as we identified that strong man, bam, he got free like that. Amen? Sometimes you need to pray. Sometimes you need prayer in terms of deliverance. But more often than not, you need truth. Listen, there's a lot of people. So let me, listen, we're, I'm here to, we're here to teach, not make you feel good. Amen? Sometimes the worst thing you can do is pray for somebody. Because what's happening is you're simply pacifying the demonic's need for attention in their life. And one of the ways that demons are empowered is by the attention of believers. When they begin to empower, when they begin to cater to, when they begin to cultivate and give attention to, you'll actually see that thing begin to get more and more empowered. And then what happens is it doesn't get empowered just in that person, but it then begins to impart fear to everybody that's in that room. And so in that place, listen, prayer is not what is needed. Truth is. Why, why is truth needed? John 8, 31 and 36, Jesus said to, the, said to those Jews who believed, if you abide in me, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And so truth that sets free is what's needed. Because sometimes a posture of prayer can simply coddle that demonic oppression. A lot of times you see this specifically when certain demonic strongholds start to get attention. And then you see how it, 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 even, it starts to feed on that attention. And you say, okay, well, what do we do in that? You speak truth to it. You tell it to stop. You remove the distraction. You say, do not give attention to this. Everyone go your way. And then you begin to speak truth to that thing. Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. Matthew 18, 18. Binding and loosing. Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay? Again, we're doing a lot of scripture tonight because I wanted to move quickly and just give you the word. Okay? There's a lot of testimonial we could do and a lot of different things we could do. But honestly, we have to be able to stand on the word when it comes to deliverance. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I actually really prefer the New American Standard version of this. The New American Standard says, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. And what that speaks to is what Jesus spoke about in John 5, 20, where the Father loves the Son and shows him all things he himself is doing, even greater works than these that we may all marvel. Because a lot of times I see people bind, trying to bind things here that aren't bound there and trying to loose things here that aren't loose there. And so before you can bind on earth, you need to know what's bound in heaven. Before you can loose on earth, you need to know what's loosed in heaven. Amen? Because sometimes people are just binding because they saw somebody else bind. Or they're loosing because somebody else loosed. Then they get in a, in a heated prayer and all of a sudden, oops, I bound something I was supposed to loose and loose something I was supposed to bind. You ever seen somebody do that? And all of a sudden they get their words crossed and feel like, man, they've just messed the whole thing up. Listen, the, Lord, listen, the Lord's power is not limited to your prayer. John 6, 28, how can we do the works of God? Jesus said, this is the work, to believe on him whom God had sent. He's a father, not a formula. So filling the house, filling the house. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, blank there is unclean, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house. See, that unclean spirit has already claimed possession of that house. He says, I will return to my house 
from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. And so what is Jesus saying there? When an unclean spirit leaves and then comes back and finds the house swept, put in order, but empty. He says, I will return to my house. You know why? Because until that house comes under the lordship of Christ, that devil still has legal access. And one of the things that I've seen is people can be delivered and then go back to the very thing they got delivered from. And Solomon wrote about it like this in Proverbs 26, verse 11. He says, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Because a lot of times when people want deliverance, they're, they're actually not wanting to walk in freedom and wholeness. They're just simply wanting a break from the pain. They get the break from the pain, like, whew, let me have a little bit more of that. And so one of the things that you have to do, you actually have to partner discipleship with deliverance. Otherwise, if, if we're just continually ministering deliverance to the same people, are we doing a disservice? And one of the first things you'll notice, even when, I, even when we're ministering here and we cast the devil out of somebody, the first thing I do is I ask them if they know Jesus, and if not, we invite them in right then. And depending on the stronghold that was in their life, they may need to rededicate their life to the Lord right then and get filled with the Holy Spirit. But I want to tell you, that's a start. That's not the end. We talked about it on, on Sunday. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is the door, but fullness is on the other side. Fullness comes in fellowship, and fullness is measured in overflow. And so it's not enough to just be saved and be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We've got to cultivate fullness. We've got to cultivate relationship. We've got to fill our house with the things of the Lord, the things of the Word, and not the things of the world. So... How do you do that? How do you fill your house? Proverbs 23, 7, that's your next blank. For as a man, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It says in Psalm, 1, Psalm 19, verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your, in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And so a lot of times it's the meditation of your heart that determines what you allow in what you ponder, what you participate in, and then what you reproduce in your life, okay? So again, that unclean spirit says, I'll come back and, find, I'll come back and return to my house. So how can we go ahead and make sure that it's no longer his house? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, you are the temple of the living God. You are the temple of the living God. Verse 16 says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And see, when you are the temple of the living God, it is no longer the devil's house. He no longer has legal right to come back to your house, your temple, because that temple is now under new ownership. Amen? He has been evicted and the new tenant has moved in. You are a temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the definition of covenant. Covenant is I will be your God, you'll be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. But verse 17, he goes on, and now listen, this is Paul. This is the apostle of grace. This is what he says. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. Why? Because if an unclean spirit leaves and comes back and finds the house empty, what Paul is saying is, listen, when the unclean spirit goes, don't go back to touching the unclean thing. Don't go back groping for the manifestation and demonstration of the spirit in your life. Don't go back trying to open a door that the Lord has shut. Amen. So he says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you should be sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You don't hear a lot of that in today's grace message. This was the apostle of grace. He had a greater revelation of grace than any one of us. And what he was saying is, listen, as a temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of the living God, you still have a responsibility to come out from among them, to be separate unto the Lord, and to not touch what is unclean. One of the reasons that we have to do that is so that we can actually be a witness to the world around us. Now, 
the armor of God. We're, again, we're talking about how to fill the house. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. We've got to move quickly. Oh my gosh, we're only on page 3. Hallelujah. We've got to hurry. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. Maybe this is where they got Wiley Coyote's name from. Amen? Stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. What Paul was saying is, he said it again in 2 Corinthians 2.11 like this, do not be ignorant of the devil's devices. And see, what happens is the devil tries to bring temptation. He tries to entertain us. He tries to pull us in through temptation to see what we're willing to make room for in our life because it says that our adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, not who he can. And when we begin to make choices in our life that open up the door to him and begin to invite him in, all of a sudden we are saying, you may devour this area in my life. And I want to tell you, When I say that when you say you make those decisions, I want to tell you, listen, that has a lot more to do with your heart than it does your hand. Romans Romans 14, 23 says, whatever is not from faith is sin. And so oftentimes what actually opens up doors in our life to allow the enemy to pillage, to plunder, and to bring hurt and heartache, it begins in our heart before it ever manifests in our hand. It begins with a strong man, a root of belief that then creates a stronghold, a house of thoughts. And if we can identify the wrong belief, we also can uproot the unrighteous actions. Amen? So he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against people, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. The blank there is darkness. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So he says, listen, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle against these other things. We are in a battle. Amen. But we're in a battle we've already won. Okay? So... This is what I want you to see. Our battle is against principalities. That's regional. Against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. So my question about darkness is how do you war against darkness? Martin Luther King Jr. said this. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So good. It was almost a Bible verse. Hallelujah. That's good, right? Darkness cannot drive out darkness. This is why most, most deliverance ministries get into error, because darkness can't drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Because when we begin to start focusing on the darkness, we actually begin to start making room for the darkness to coexist. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. And so he's talking about how to stand. Truth. Again, he didn't even say, listen, their prayer is a part of this, but it began with truth. Notice prayer don't even show up till verse 18. He starts with having your waist girded with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does that mean? What is righteousness? It is right standing with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, He who knew no sin became sin for you that you become the righteousness of God in Christ. You know what it looks like to put on the breastplate of righteousness? It means to put on Christ. In fact, it says in Romans 13, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to make no provision to fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what Pastor Jeff was talking about with plan B's. Paul was saying, listen, Paul was speaking to the, to the Roman church. He said, listen, put on the Lord and don't have this well, if this doesn't work out, I could do this. Or don't have this little thing hidden over here just in case you have a, a weak moment. Hallelujah. I loved it. There was a church we went to in Selma, Alabama. Me and Caleb, we did a healing conference. They had a box of Little Debbie nailed to the wall. They had crutches, wheelchair, Little Debbie. I said, I can, I can respect that. <laughs> Remember that? They had a box of Swiss cake rolls. It was awesome. Ooh. One man's trash is another man's treasure. (laughs) Amen. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. 
Stand therefore, having your waist girl with truth, breastplate of righteousness. So what the breastplate is, is what Christ says about you and who you are in Christ. That's right there. The devil can't get through that. Amen? Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means that when you're going into a place, you're going to extend the shalom of God. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Why above all? Because in the same way that fiery, fiery darts work against your faith, faith works against fiery darts. Psalm 64 says, The wicked bend their bows and release their arrows, bitter words of the righteous in secret places. Psalm 64, verses 3 and 4. So the enemy has bitter words, fiery darts, but guess what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so that shield of faith is continuing to hear what God has said and to stand guard behind what the Lord has said. And so when the enemy tries to release these fiery darts of accusation and assumption and and all of these things that were were meant to try to find a place in your heart to bring destruction and to bring harm and, and insecurity, you just begin to hold up what God has said. Whether it be about your about who you are, whether it be about a particular situation, maybe it's a promise you're believing for, and the enemy's been trying to bring condemnation that'll never come to pass. Has God said, will God do, just like Satan in the garden? You begin to raise the shield of faith. How do you raise the shield of faith? By reminding the devil what God has said. Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, he said, To wage good warfare according to the prophecies that have been given to you. Not, not, not losing faith and suffering shipwreck. Why did, the others lo- Why did the others suffer shipwreck? Because they lost their shield of faith. When you lose the shield of faith, you, ha- you have shipwreck because you get stalled out where you are. Does this make sense? goes on and says, and take the helmet of salvation. In Thessalonians, it says the helmet of the hope of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and praying always with all prayer and supplication and the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So prayer is a part, but notice it begins with truth. And I think a lot of times we're just looking for prayer. We're just trying to get somebody's faith to change our circumstance in the moment, kind of like, man, I got a pain, give me some Advil. Instead of saying, listen, I want the truth of the scalpel to cut out the tumor. It may hurt. How do you know? Listen, sometimes the truth can hurt. But it cuts so good. Cuts so good. And if you got the right person wielding truth in your life, love will always be the byproduct. I want to tell you this. This is one of the things our friend Dan Muller taught us. If you, if you cannot bring truth to someone from a place of love in your heart for the best God has for that person, you do not have authority to bring truth in that situation. Your love for that person is what gives you authority to bring truth. It actually creates a bridge of trust that you can bring a truck of truth. Otherwise, there's a lot of people trying to drive like trucks of truth, and their bridge of trust is not approved for that type of capacity. Amen? Keep your Facebook comments to yourself. What are the... Uh... I'm just kidding. What... <laughs> Deaf and dumb spirit. What are some of the effects of the deaf and dumb spirit? This is, again, this is a broad spectrum. Is this helping you guys tonight? Listen, if you can't laugh talking about deliverance, you can't laugh. Some of the effects of the deaf and dumb spirit, again, broad spectrum, okay? Number one, it is behind many learning disabilities. I'm going to show you this in Scripture. Two, it hinders revelation. So the first blank is learning disability. The second, it hinders revelation. It also can delay or hinder healing. You see this, of course, with... The father who, who had unbelief and his son's healing was delayed. It was hindered because of a faithless generation that had resulted in the father's unbelief. And we're going to look at tonight what caused the father to have unbelief about his son's situation. You actually can see it in scripture. It was actually the religious argument of the day brought the dad into unbelief. It creates mental blocks. It creates confusion, mental fog. It also produces what I call self-sabotage. Self-sabotage. In other words, self-sabotage means you get right at the moment of breakthrough, and then it's almost like without thinking, you do something stupid that just sinks your battleship. It's like you have, and it, and, and it, and it happens in cycles. You, you're able to do something to a certain place, and then all of a sudden, you just, either you don't finish what you started, or, or you, you just, you know, you get but so far into a task, and then you just destroy it, and you don't even know why. You don't even know why. 
You ever, you ever met anybody like that? They get right to the moment of breakthrough and then they self-sabotage. It's almost like they're wearing this suicide jacket and you don't know when it's going to go off. It can also be at the root of attention deficit disorder, bipolar, schizophrenia, memory issues, memory issues, physical deafness, spiritual deafness, and it creates a perception of closed heavens. It creates a perception of closed heavens. How many of you know the heavens are opened? Amen? But there's a lot of people living in the reality of a closed heaven because of what they perceive. Because of what they perceive. Again, I love what Bill Johnson says. He says, for most people, the heavens are closed right here. Okay? And so the truth is, the reality, you, listen, something can be true and it can be real. And if you're ignorant of the truth, it doesn't benefit you. In fact, if you go to another nation and you're not aware of their laws, you can actually be living in less than what's available to you out of ignorance. And even as it relates to the heavens, sometimes because of either religious thinking, bad teaching, or just a bad belief structure that has come from a lie that the enemy has sown in their heart, people have chosen to embrace a theology and a doctrine of a closed heaven when the heavens are as available to be open to them as they are to you and me. And you can feel this geographically. There's places that I go where you can feel people have agreed with a closed heaven in this place. I can have an open heaven, but they've, they've agreed for a closed heaven. You can go, you can have good meetings, God can move mightily, but when you move, when you go back, things close up. What is the antidote? What is the antidote? Isaiah 10, 27. What is the antidote to the deaf and dumb spirit? What is the antidote for deliverance? It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. The anointing oil. Now, one of the things, now again, if an unclean spirit leaves, we've got to fill the house with something else, right? Right? So the unclean spirit leaves. When it returns to its house, we want, it to see it, we want them to see it under new ownership. There is a new tenant that moved in. So who is the new tenant that is moving in? Because a lot of times, listen, this thing manifests in learning disabilities. It manifests in mental disorders. It manifests in schizophrenia, bipolar, cloudiness, mental fog. Again, there can be varying degrees. And so if that unclean spirit leaves, what is the opposite of that spirit that then needs to come and to inhabit our temple? You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're a temple of the living God. John 14, 26. And this is what we're going to pray for people tonight. When we take authority over the deaf and dumb spirit and we begin to just do mass deliverance, not only are we going to begin to bind that, but we're going to loose the ministry of the Holy Spirit as teacher. And what's going to happen is when we break this thing off of you, you're actually going to be released into excellence and ingenuity. All of a sudden, where you, where you felt like that you would read books and you couldn't retain what you read, all of a sudden, it'll almost be like you, you're like a speed reader. You'll be able to, like, to, to just, to just de- devour books and to be able to eat these books. Let me ask you this. There are people here tonight who are feeling um, an unexplainable sense of fatigue, almost like this sleepiness. Oh, that's a devil. You don't have it, but it's right now it's trying to distract you. I, I, I have felt this thing pushing in. Again, how many of you have that? Have you, how many of you have been battling that tonight? Stand up. Some of you, even, you know, shikiri baba. Hallelujah. And everybody got plenty of sleep, amen, amen. Nobody had a big lunch, big, big dinner. See, what happens, he tries to distract you. He tries to create a low ceiling of expectation. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I command stupor to come off right now in the name of Jesus. I take authority over that spirit of slumber right now that would cause us to try to miss out on what the Spirit of God is wanting to release in this place. And right now, I speak, because here's the thing is, what you're doing is you're actually discerning 
a stronghold that is trying to work against what God is wanting to do here. And so instead of agreeing with it and being a victim, what I want you to choose to do right now with your heart and with your mouth is to swim upstream. And so the count of three, we're just going to release a shout. We're going to release a roar and it's going to be like smelling salts. All of a sudden you're going to come off the ropes. You're going to begin to back up where you've been knocked down and you're going to be like, whoo, man, I feel 10 foot tall and bulletproof. I feel the anointing of the Kool-Aid man. Hallelujah. So right now on the count of three, how many of you feel the atmosphere shifting already? Because see, when you identify the strong man, see, it's a spirit of stupor, a spirit of slumber that brings confusion and mental fogginess. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I command that thing, go in Jesus' name. On the count of three, release a shout. One, two, three. Yeah! Hey! Boom. Now how many feel open? Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout of praise and sit back down. I'll finish up real quick. I felt that thing worn against our worship tonight too. Didn't you feel it? Devil. Satan hates worship, man. Listen, sometimes the key to your worship is getting your eyes off of you because worship ain't about you. Listen, that's why it's called a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes you just got to pull it together. David had to, he said, he, said he, he had to bless the Lord on my soul. He had to tell himself to bless God. He said he had to remind himself who forgives all my diseases, who heals all my iniquities. Because listen, right then, he probably didn't feel like it. He had to say, self, soul, body, we're going to praise him right now. Because honestly, your praise is the most powerful when you feel least like praising. Ain't that right, Jeff? When, you, when, when all of a sudden you feel like the world has knocked the wind out of you, when you can find the voice of worship and release the shout of praise, it'll begin to shift atmospheres and change climates. Listen, the light that we're called to is not for the faint of heart. We are worshiping warrior kings. Amen. We're not just here to go with the crowd. Amen. We're here to pioneer a new movement. We're here to forerun. We're here to blaze a new trail. We're here to see the entire body of Christ move into where God has called us to be. Amen. I don't know about you, but I was not born to settle for the status quo. I was not born to allow the five o'clock news to tell me what my day is like and what my tomorrow will be. Amen. I don't look to the weather channel to see what the next 10 days are going to look like. I look to the spirit of God and I begin to prophesy, I begin to declare, I begin to decree. And could it be that we allow the world, to, the world around us to take authority over the word of God in us? We got to rise up. We got to rise up, sons and daughters of God. We got to listen. If we want to walk in this ministry of power, this ministry of deliverance, it does not come uh, just by kind of sitting back and just letting. What, so what is that French thing? Say la. Is that whatever. Say la vie. Hallelujah. Whatever. We need people who are going to begin to push forward. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence to violence, take it by force. Where there is no ox in the trough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of the ox. Increase is Hebrew for poop. Hallelujah. Things get messy. Amen. But when things get messy, stuff happens. Where there is no oxen, the trough is clean. What's that saying is, listen, if you want, if you want just a nice little clean, put together life, have at it. This probably is not the place for you. But if you want to see increase come to your life, if you want to start seeing the fields of harvest plowed, if you want to see God make a difference in and through your life, I want to tell you part of the difference being made is a mess. But like we say, yesterday's crap is today's fertilizer for tomorrow's harvest. Amen. All right, we got to hurry. Hallelujah. Those devils are getting restless. So again, we're going to bind this, 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 the, 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 um, we're going to bind the stronghold of unbelief. We're going to take authority over the deaf and dumb spirit, and we're going to loosen its place to help her, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. When I had a revelation of this scripture and this scripture came alive in my heart, I went from being just a normal person, honestly, a drug addict, a drug dealer. I was not the smartest guy in the room. I was always good looking. <laughs> but mentally, I wasn't the sharpest guy. But it, when all of a sudden, I went from being a regular person to a genius. Photographic memory. I mean, I've got revelation about things I've never heard about. I can have conversations with people about things I've never researched and I've heard about it for the first time. And just right then I can step in and I can talk like an expert in just about any field. And the reason why is because the Holy Spirit is my teacher. My, my faith is not in my natural ability. It's not in a book I've read. It's in the fact that the living God is on the inside of me. And I tell you that because that is available to each and every one of us. Amen. 
Hallelujah. 1 John 2.20 says, You have an anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. See, it's the anointing that causes you to know all things. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things, Suze. Hallelujah. 1 John 2.27 says, That anointing which you receive from Him, it abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. Now, John was not saying that they don't need teachers, because, hello, teachers are part of the fivefold function. What he was saying is he was speaking to these people who were creating a dependency in their life to lean on the wisdom of man instead of the wisdom of God. What he was saying is you don't need a mediator between you and God. He said you don't need someone else to teach these things. The helper, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you all these things. And that's going to be one of the things that we loose tonight is that you would encounter the Holy Spirit, not just as the baptism, not just as tongues, not just as healer, not just as deliverer, but as teacher, how many in the body of Christ, how many in the world know Holy Spirit as the teacher of all things? Amen. When you begin to know that and you begin to recognize that you've got a first person audience with the one who has the answer to every question that has ever been asked or ever will be asked. Listen, he's, he's way better than Wikipedia. Before you go to Google, go to God. The same anointing teaches you concerning all things. The blank there is teaches. And is true and is not a lie. And just as it is taught you, you will abide in him. Again, that's 1 John 2, 27. Well, we gotta move quick. Dear Lord. I get so excited about these things. The outline is just kind of like banks to keep the river moving forward. But hallelujah, the river's rising. When we pray tonight, people are going to, uh, I felt this strongly when I was praying today, people are going to all of a sudden, you're going you're gonna to all of a sudden feel like the heavens are open. Even though the heavens have been open, you're going you're gonna to know that they're open up over, li- over your life. It's like the lights are going to be brighter, the colors are going to be richer, and what's going to happen is you're going to begin to dream again, and many of you are going to start having prophetic encounters and experiences. Those of you who have not dreamed, in fact, those of you who have been tormented in the night season, those of you who have not been able to rest, you lay down and sleep, but you wake up tired, listen, you're going to sleep so deep tonight, you're going to have prophetic dreams tonight, you're going to begin to have visions tonight, and all of a sudden, open heaven will be your new reality, and it's going to be a sudden, it's going to go like you went from one to the other with one prayer. Blessed are your eyes. Blessed are your eyes and blessed are your ears. Matthew 13. I'm just going to try to read this and not teach it for the sake of time. Matthew 13, 14 through 16. It says, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. This is about a people, a generation, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. That's, that shows that it's a progression. How does a heart grow dull? Hebrews chapter 3 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, it is in rebellion. So the hearts grow dull from hearing the word and not responding to what the word says. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their, and their eyes they have closed. That's a choice. Jesus is saying, Their eyes they have closed. They made the choice to close their eyes. They had eyes, they had the ability to see, but their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But verse 16 is what I want to say to you. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Now, Mark chapter 8, verses 13 through 18, real quickly, Jesus addresses hard hearts. And how our hearts become hard. And this is connected, of course, to the deliverance. It's also connected to the deaf and dumb spirit. See, it's not enough just to get free. We want to also be able to understand how to remain free and bring freedom to others. Amen? It says, and when he left them, getting into the boat again, departing to the other side, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is the religious spirit, and the leaven of Herod, which is the political spirit. He said, beware of the leaven of the religious spirit, beware of the leaven of the political spirit. And they reasoned on themselves saying, is it because we have no bread? He had just multiplied. I mean, look, they've got a loaf, 
they just saw him feed 5,000, and now he's talking about leaven, and they're like, oh, God, we didn't bring enough bread. This is the God who already multiplied not enough bread to be more than enough. And why, why, why could they not hear what he was saying? Why, have you ever wondered that, you, know, that you, could, you could be in the same meeting with somebody, you could be in the same conversation with somebody, some, you, you guys could hear the same conversation, you hear one thing, they hear something else, you go, where'd you get that from, buddy? Sometimes it's Leviathan, sometimes it's twisted communication, oftentimes it's a hard heart because people hear what they want you to say. They can actually project, they, they can begin to twist and manipulate what you say if their heart is hard to actually empower them in their unbelief. So he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Verse 16, and they reasoned among themselves saying, it's because we have no bread. But Jesus being aware of it said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Verse 18, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Do you not remember? He's saying, don't you remember the miracle? You're worried about bread? We just fed the 5,000. When I broke the five, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of, gram, full of garments did you take up? 12, right? Why 12? Because there's 12 disciples. Jesus did not just multiply the fish and the loaves to meet the need, but he then put the ministry of multiplication into the hands of the disciples. What he was saying is, listen, I put what I did in your hands, and I'm telling you tonight that what Jesus did, he's put into your hands as well. They had been given the ministry of multiplication, and now they had forgot that miracle. And see, what happens is, Every time we get a miracle in our life, every time God breaks through for us, like Pastor Jeff spoke about, we then become accountable to that level of revelation. We have to then live from that miracle forward, okay? He goes on to say, uh, also when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said seven. So he said to them, how is it that you do not understand? And he connected their lack of understanding with forgetting who God was and what God had done. So... Jesus addressed the hard heart. He identified spiritual deafness and blindness. He identified identified the fact that they were resisting the word. And because of that, they were resisting the leading of God in their life. He identified that offense breeds unbelief and unbelief creates disconnection. He identified that oftentimes people who have become jaded in their life or offended in their walk have allowed their hearts to become hard over time. So, how do we keep our hearts from getting hard? It says, keep your heart with all diligence, Proverbs chapter four, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. Maintaining a healthy spiritual heart is your responsibility. It is your responsibility. You are the gardener of your own garden. It does not matter how much truth you're taught if you still choose to believe a lie. All right, so causes of hard heart and spiritual deafness. Number one, it's when we forget the works of God. The blank there is forget. Psalm 78, it says that they limited the Holy One of Israel because they forgot his works. They limited his power. Also, the religious spirit, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 there, says they had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. We're going to look at why that's important when we look at the deaf and dumb spirit. The political spirit, Mark chapter 8, verse 15. Again, we, we just read about that. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And again, that, that political spirit is a man-pleasing spirit. It says it, it's trying to do things for the approval of others. It's doing things that are not necessarily in your heart to do, but you're, tr- you're doing certain things trying to get certain people to like you. You're trying to align with, with who they are and what they do by being someone you're not. Okay? The religious spirit tries to disassociate through association. It says we're not them because we're this. That's where denominationalism came in. And then the political spirit. So you see the leaven of the Pharisees, leaven of Herod. Number four, the operation of witchcraft and the cultic activity. So the blank there is witchcraft. Five, the deceitfulness of sin. Again, we're looking at how a heart can become hard and, and, and we can come into spiritual deaf, deafness. 
the deceitfulness of sin. The, the, the verse there is Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 15. It is the exhortation, let us capture the little foxes. Let us capture the little, or catch us the little foxes. Six, being hearers and not doers of the word. Being hearers and not doers of the word. You have several scriptures there to support that. You can look at on your own. Number seven, this is a big one. Departing from the living God. Departing from the living God. Hebrews chapter three, verses 12 through 14 says, beware brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. An evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. He didn't say a form of godliness. He said the living God. The living God is a God of power. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. I'll tell you, Hebrews is amazing. Hebrews is awesome. If you never know where to read your Bible, just read Psalms and Hebrews and you'll find your way. Amen? Number eight, unbelief. We looked at that in Hebrews 3.12. We're going to look at it in Mark 9.24. Being preoccupied with the cares of this world. Being preoccupied with the cares of this world. The scripture there is Mark chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. It says, now these are the ones sown among the thorns. They're the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And so it's the deceitfulness of riches. It's being preoccupied with the cares of this world. It's allowing the lusts of this life to create unrighteous desire in your heart. There's three things. Choke out the word. Now, these are the ones sown among the thorns. They're the ones who hear the word. They hear the word. They come to the service. They take notes. Yes and amen. But then the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for others' things enter in after the word is sown and choke out that word. you got to protect that word. you got to beat back them buzzards. Remember when Abraham made covenant with God? Those buzzards tried to come down. And try to mess with his covenant, he had to beat them birds back. You got to beat back the birds of the air and say, no, this is my word. This is my God. I'm not backing up. Amen? Number 12, not using the gifts God has given you. The scripture there is Hebrews chapter 5. It says, by reason of use, we have our senses exercised to discern between good and evil. Number 13, this actually came out of a conversation Pastor Jody and I were having yesterday with Stephen Suzanne Lemmy. It's a... when your waters become stagnant. And, I, and I, I mentioned something to them at lunch and I said, I want, I want Kingsway to be a place where, where people's waters can run wild. John seven thirty seven says that if you're thirsty and you come to him, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. Proverbs 5.15 is your scripture there. Proverbs 5.15 says to drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. How do you get your water to run? You give it an opportunity to flow. And one of the things that I feel like even in this house, we're supposed to do is we're, cre- we're to create opportunities for what's on the inside to come out, whether that be in creativity, whether that be in praying for healing, whether it be in prophesying, serving, but a place where your waters can run. Amen? Now, there got to be banks to the river, otherwise there's runoff. But the problem is a lot of times when we begin to allow the waters of gifting and grace and anointing in us to remain stagnant, all of a sudden it creates a hard heart. It creates a heart of unbelief. It creates spiritual deafness. How do waters become stagnant when they have nowhere to run? All right, it's deliverance time. You ready? Here we are. Addressing the deaf and dumb spirit. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. Jesus had just been on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, okay? Amazing, right? Moses came down, Elijah came down, incredible. They come back down, and so it's the other nine disciples. So you got Jesus, Peter, James, and John, and then the other nine are at the bottom of the mountain. And so this story right here is an argument that the other nine are having with the religious leaders of their day. 
Verse 14 says, and when he, Jesus, came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? What are you scribes, this religious spirit, discussing with my disciples? One of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they, that they should cast him out, but they could not. Now, so there was a dispute happening between the scribes and disciples. What was the dispute? It was the dispute over the lack of their power to heal and deliver. The dispute was, does God still heal? And this is how Jesus responds to this, does God still heal? Because here's the thing is, people who will try to argue healing and deliverance, they'll always try to present the case of the one person who didn't get healed. I know all these people, other people got healed. What about this guy? So God don't heal. Blessed is he who's not offended because of me. That's what Jesus told John the Baptist. And it always tries to create a case of fear, doubt, and unbelief. So this is how Jesus addressed him. He answered him and said, O faithless generation. Again, see, it was a people group. O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you and how long shall I bear with? Or how long am I going to have to put up with y'all? Bring the boy to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Now notice, Jesus didn't jump right in. Boy comes up, begins to manifest. A lot of times we would have been throwing modesty blankets and shiggity babas and hallelujahs. Jesus said, how long is this been going on? See, because he wanted to move forward with wisdom, understanding, and intent. And the father said it. Often he has thrown him both into, he says, it's been going on since childhood. Often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. See, again, it's self-sabotage. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So he recognized this has done this to him, but help us, have compassion on us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And then the father, in this amazing moment of transparency, says immediately the father of the child cried out and said, with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And listen, any of us who have ever had a sick child to where our child was sick and we didn't know what to do to take away the pain in that moment, whether it be a fever, whether it be a stomach condition, whether it be something far worse, have known what it was like to be in that situation and say, Lord, I've done all that I know to do. Help. And that's what that father was praying. I believe. Help me with my unbelief. But what Jesus identified that few people gather out of the scripture, Jesus identified the connection between The father's unbelief was actually the fruit of the root of this this religious dispute. There had been a religious dispute that God no longer healed. There was a faithless generation that had created a geographical stronghold. And because of that, the byproduct in this individual's life was, I'm believing the best I can, but to be honest, I've got a little unbelief. I've been listening to some stuff right now that's created a question in my heart. How many of us have ever heard some things about God that created a question in our heart about our circumstance. We all have. The best thing to do is to give this to God, to recognize, you know what? I've got some cards in my hand the Lord didn't deal me. They're not in the Bible. People can ask, why do bad things happen to good people? But you know what? The scripture says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And so instead of creating a doctrine out of someone else's question, I'd rather create a doctrine out of his answer. So he goes on, it says, Jesus saw that the people came running together. He rebuked, 
He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Come out and don't go back in. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. And so several things the Lord identifies here. One, the father repents of unbelief. Why was that necessary? Because there was a stronghold. The stronghold was unbelief. The spirit was deaf and dumb. The stronghold was unbelief. The spirit was deaf and dumb. The religious debate had produced unbelief. Personally, I can literally feel power drain from my inner man when talking to someone who has a religious spirit. I get Facebook messages from people that they're not really wanting an answer to their question. They're wanting someone to talk to. I'm not that guy. Like, if you just want somebody to Facebook message, I'm not the guy. Don't do it to me. I got a lot of things I got to do, and I don't like to go back and forth. I'm real quick answers. Hallelujah. I can feel, even when somebody comes up to me in person, and they, they, they're coming up with a religious spirit and a religious agenda, I can feel my inner man beginning to weaken. It's almost like I feel my battery going low. How many of you know what I'm talking about? But how many of you are replied enough, to, polite enough to allow them to keep talking? I want to tell you, listen, when you allow them to keep talking, it's causing you to miss out on something God wants you to see. Because every time one of those people show up, there's something just on the other side of that person God's wanting you to see. And that situation, they're a good person. You don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but bless God, there's some darkness trying to war against your light by putting this distraction in front of you. And so what you got to do is very politely say, listen, I love you. I bless you. That's a great question. I'm probably not the one to give you the answer, but I bet Jesus is. Have you asked the Lord about that? That's all. Let's get Baba. Hallelujah. It's a great way to respond. Have you asked the Lord about that? Ask the Lord about it, then I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Let's look at Matthew 17, 14 through 21. I want you to see this from a different, different point of view. You guys okay? Okay. I know we're going a little bit late, so... This is important. Again, next week, we're going to finish the whole healing school. We'll be able to pack it in next week. So don't miss. The night before Thanksgiving will be the big hallelujah. Everybody get healed and then fill up with turkey the next day. (laughs) Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 21. Same account, different perspective. They came down off the Mount of Transfiguration, okay? And as they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, in verse 14, it says, And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to him, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So notice this here. Have you ever heard somebody say that they, you know, well, you know, you didn't get healed because you don't have enough faith. Listen, Jesus always has enough faith. Not having enough faith is different than unbelief. Jesus, Jesus didn't say you didn't have enough faith. He said, the problem is you had unbelief. He said, because of your unbelief, for sure that I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there and it'll, and it'll be done. Nothing will be impossible for you. What he was saying was when you prayed, you didn't, you didn't pray from the mustard seed faith. You actually went from unbelief. You approached the situation imagining what couldn't be done. 
You approach the situation magnifying the issue you are praying for. Because whatever you magnify, whether it's the God as a healer or the sickness. See, sometimes your perspective of that person's sickness is too big. And you got to back up and get your peace. You got to back up and say, you know what? I got to magnify the Lord a little bit. I got to begin to remind myself who God is in this situation. Because right now, that's why sometimes when you're praying for somebody to get healing, you don't want to listen very long to what's wrong with them. Because if you listen too long, you're like, oh, hey, for too long, you feel a symptom. And so sometimes, so when you're praying for somebody, don't say, hey, listen, I don't need to know everything that's wrong. Just tell me, what is it that you need the Lord to do for you? What is it? What do you need healed? Let me, come on. I want to agree with you for what you need God to do. I don't want to hear the story about what your aunt did and your third grade teacher and everybody else and da, 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 da. I don't care. I care about you, but I don't care about that. I want to see heaven come. And see, a lot of times people have been so used to rehearsing their sob story they're so connected with mourning, they forgot there even was an oil of joy. And when you begin to listen to that, you almost kind of feel like that short circuit, Johnny Five, no alive. You guys remember that? Johnny Five. Hallelujah. So Jesus here, in, in Mark chapter 9, he's mute. Matthew chapter 17, he's epileptic. Same spirit, same boy, same dad. The word epileptic if you see in your footnotes there, it actually means moonstruck or crazy. It actually means unable to think or act normally. And so epilepsy, the actual, the actual condition, the infirmity, the condition of epilepsy is a real thing. And we're going to pray for those tonight who have epilepsy. But also this deaf and dumb spirit in some people, they just couldn't act or think normally. And and the Amplified here, verse 15 says, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. Now listen, the the word lunatic then and and today is different. It wasn't like like lunatic. It was the word lunatic meant moonstruck and suffers terribly, for he often falls into the fire and into the water. Again, moonstruck means unable to think or act normally. And what I began to think about, and a lot of times moonstruck is used as 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 a description of someone's heart who's fallen in love. And see, the problem, when you, fall in, when you fall in love, you're easily distracted. And one of the things that's connected to the spirit is, you, is you're easily distracted, okay? So when we break this off of you tonight, you're going to come into excellence. The heavens are going to open up over you. We're going to begin to release right now this prayer. But with this, I want to also r- remind you that some of you, again, this, it says that this spirit cannot come out by prayer and fasting. Don't make that a formula, some of you are going to feel the Lord leading you into what I call a faith fast. Some of you may feel called to go on a faith fast, but we need to learn to be spirit-led when it comes to fasting, recognizing there are times and even seasons God calls you into times of fasting. Romans ten seventeen says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Why is it that 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 Lord said this spirit does not come out by prayer and fasting. Was he somehow earning something from God? Listen, fasting does not earn something from God. What fasting does is it quiets your competing appetites so that you can hear more clearly. The blank there is hear more clearly. Fasting quiets competing appetites so that you can hear more clearly. That being said, don't create a formula out of it. I told Tina all over the weekend, I said, well, I guess I better fast Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because we got to go after the deaf and dumb spirit on Wednesday night because this only comes up by prayer and fasting. Well, on Monday, I started fasting about four o'clock. I had a spirit of murder come on me that only Smith and Wesson were going to take out. Amen. I said, I need to eat a sandwich. Here's what happened was I was positioning my heart based on a past knowledge and past experience. Well, this comes out by prayer and fasting. So I must be able to, I must need to fast to have authority on Wednesday. And I said, Lord, did you ask me to do this fast? He goes, no, I didn't ask you to do this fast eat a sandwich. And guess what? When I ate the sandwich, I actually felt more anointed. And so don't just fast as a religious activity. We must, as a people, be spirit-led and recognize in true seasons of fasting, there is a grace to fast, to where there's actually a joy in, in pushing away from the table and partaking of the goodness of God. Okay? 
So again, when we talk about a fasting of faith, the example there for, your, for faith is the persistent widow. Luke 18, 8 says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man has come, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Okay? And again, that faith is modeled in persistence. So let's go ahead. We've got our activation, and then we've got a prayer of repentance, and I'm going to pray. Everybody okay? All right. Activation. Number one, this is for each and every one of you to do. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you any areas of unbelief you need to repent of. When we were talking about creating and cultivating an atmosphere for the anointing, we actually had a prayer of repentance for unbelief. I would encourage you, any areas the Lord highlights to you of unbelief, go back and pray that prayer specifically in those areas. Ask the Lord to remind you of any prayers you've given up praying and any promises you stopped believing for. Ask him to help you to persist in faith until you see the answer. Make a list and begin to contend and war for the answers. Because again, when hardness of heart comes, we begin to back away from the promise. An example would be, of course, Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 10. Of course, there was this 21 days of fasting for Daniel, this Daniel's fast. But in Daniel chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, I want you to see this. It says, I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord, and I and I I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the peoples of the land. Guess what? Daniel was not guilty of anything of what he was repenting of. Whose sins was he repenting of? The father's. He was repenting of the sins of the fathers who had brought Israel into captivity. Why? Because a generation had brought in strongholds. And he knew another generation could bring it out. And right now, God is beginning to anoint Joseph's and Daniel's to begin to rise up within the marketplace, within the church, within areas of influence, to begin to shift climates, to begin to change geographical atmospheres, and to begin to undo what generations before us have allowed in. Daniel stood and repented before the Lord on back. Come out of him. Just kidding. Daniel stood (laughs) and (laughs) repented before the Lord on behalf of the sins of his fathers. Amen? And one of the things we're going to do tonight is we're going to repent on behalf of the sins of previous generations. And then we're going to minister. Daniel 9, 19, Daniel said, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. So everybody stand to your feet. We're going to pray this together, and then I'm going to pray for you. Once we pray this, if you have kids and king's kids, I'm going to ask that you go and you get them and bring them back. Again, next Wednesday, we'll finish up with this and prayerfully we can get back to that seven to nine o'clock window for these Wednesday nights. It is not my heart, not my prayer to ever keep us late, but bless God, these have been some really full Wednesday nights. Amen? We've pulled it in as much as I feel like we could pull it in. So this is a prayer of repentance. We're going to pray this together. Okay, all on the count of three. Say, Lord, I stand in the gap and I ask you to forgive us as your people in this city for walking in unbelief and holding to doctrines of man which have strengthened the deaf and dumb spirit. Please forgive us for holding to a form of godliness but denying your awesome power by our wrong beliefs, words, and actions. We ask that you would cleanse us and release us as a people, as a city, as a region, as a state, and even as a nation from the demonic chains that have hindered 
your supernatural power operating in our city, our state, and our nation. I pray for new beginnings for us and that we would come to know you in your fullness. Holy Spirit, come and fill my heart with love, compassion, and unwavering faith-filled prayer. Let me stand for the promises you have spoken to me and continue to pray for those who are bound in my city. As I ask these things, in Jesus' name, I say, I believe. Amen. Amen. Now, let me ask you, if you're here tonight and you, you need prayer for any of what we spoke about earlier, I want you to run to the front right now. I'm going to pray on mass for everybody, but specifically, if you're coming down, you're saying, listen, some of this has been active and operating in my life, and I don't want it to operate any longer. Again, if you have kids and King's kids, feel free to go grab them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Jeff, I'm going to need you to play for me, bub. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord's about to shift the anointing in the room. Second Kings chapter 4, Elisha called for the minstrel to begin to play. And when the minstrel began to play, the hand of the Lord. And see, it's not always that you need, but some t- sometimes there's a sound that releases a shift. Amen? Thank you, Holy Spirit. We're going to pray on mass, and I'm just going to come down and begin to lay hands on you. Again, if you have kids and king's kids, please go ahead and go get them. Bring them back. And again, if anybody out there, if listen, if you're here tonight and you're bound, you can either leave here like you came or you can be free. The choice is yours. Amen? Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that deaf and dumb spirit. And I command that deaf and, deaf and dumb spirit now, come out. Come out, come out now in the name of Jesus. Right now, I take authority over every demonic influence that has tried to hinder your learning ability, that has tried to create confusion within your personality, that has tried to bring a mental clarity and a fog to your life right now in the name of Jesus. Loose now in Jesus' name. There it is. There it is. There it is. Go ahead and look at me. Right now. In Jesus' name. Right now. Ben, David, Aaron, Steve, Jody, go ahead and let's start praying for some folks. <sighs> Jesus, thank you, Lord. Right now. <sighs> Father, right now. Go. I command darkness to leave right now. Darkness, go right now. Confusion, go. Where there's been learning disabilities right now, Father. I speak healing. I speak deliverance right now. I call you into your right mind in Jesus' name. Now, 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 I break off darkness. I break off heaviness. Now, whoa, ho, 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 ho. We break off generational strongholds right now in Jesus' name. Lord, areas where the generations before us have welcomed in Lord, this spirit we command loose in Jesus' name. Loose. Loose. I'm going to go this way and come back. Of Jesus. Now. 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 Loose. Right there. Jesus' name right now. Loose. 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 Every chain, break every chain, 
break every chain. Right now, in the name of Jesus, even as we bind this deaf and dumb spirit, I loose the ministry right now of Holy Spirit as teacher. Holy Spirit as teacher right now. We loose the Holy Spirit who teaches all things. Power, so much power. There it is. Jill Roberts, begin to pray for people. Jill Roberts, begin to pray. Here, pray for your mom with me. Hallelujah. Loose, loose. There it is. Loose, 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 loose. Come on, right now we release you into excellence right now. Right now. We release you right now. I command that demonic stronghold to be broken off of you now in Jesus' name. There it is. Margaret, keep praying for people. Come on, pray for her. Shungarabamba, yes. There it is. Shungarabaha. Kondarabandaraba sondo. Shikere de mandoraba sondara masaka. Shinde de bandarama sondaraba sondo. Shumbara. Loose right now. Mm. Jesus. Father, right now. Mm. Lord, right now we break agreement with every label that is not in your heart toward us or for us in Jesus' name. And Sonny, if you're able to pray even with the kids, just now, loose, loose. There it is, there it is, there it is. Now, comes off in Jesus' name right now. Couldn't look at me. Break 
break every chain. You break every chain. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we bind every voice that is contrary to the voice of the Lord right now. I command darkness to leave your life, and I loose light in its place now in Jesus' name. We loose light. Look at me, Bob. Right now, in the name, go ahead, look at me. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over that spirit, and I command it to leave your life and never return again in Jesus' name. Now! Come on, come on. Tonight is a night that will change the rest of your life. I believe it with all my heart. Now, loose right now. <laughs> Jesus. Come on, tonight is a night. Right now. Darkness goes. Jesus, Father, right now. We send the word. We send the anointing right now. In Jesus' name, right now. Come on, some of you, he's rewiring your brain right now. If I get, Aaron Roberts, once you're done praying for whoever you're praying for, come to me. If you've already had prayer or you're waiting for prayer, the best posture I can encourage you to get into is a posture of worship. Josh, begin to pray for people. Margaret, if you can pray for people, pray for Dave. Begin to bless the cognitive abilities right now. Lord, right now, I speak to cognitive abilities right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, right now. I break off labels right now in Jesus' name. Go ahead and look at me, Reg. <laughs> Man, hallelujah. God, I thank you for freedom. God, I thank you for freedom. God, I think it was for freedom that you set us free, God. Freedom, you set us free, God. Freedom, you set us free, God. Yes, God. We break off. We break off that deaf and dumb spirit right now. Every spirit of rejection right now, we command it to go now in Jesus' name, right now. Caleb, come here. Come on. We command that rejection to go right now in the name of Jesus. Caleb, begin to pray. Reagan, Reagan Salter, Reagan and Chloe, go pray for Brook Brooklyn, Brookie, go pray for Brookie, red shirt right there. Now, I remove labels from you right now, Melody, in the name of Jesus. You come on, there it is, let it out. Ava, let me see your hand. Ava, come pray for Melody right here. There it is. There it is. Now, loose in Jesus' name. I need to feel your gaze. And won't you come and breathe over me? And won't you
If you've not yet gotten prayer, just move to the front. If you've not yet gotten prayer, just move to the front right now. Do not, try not to, we've got a number of people in real God moments right now where the Lord is moving upon them. Don't interrupt that. But if you need prayer, keep coming down to the front.
Again, if you're here and you've not yet got prayer, just let us know. Father, right now, we release the ministry of the Holy Spirit right now as teacher. You said in Luke 11, 13, that you give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And so right now, begin to start inviting the Holy Spirit to come as your teacher, the anointing by which you know all things. seasons and times past that you that were all about you pouring out but this is a season that's all about you overflowing this isn't a season that you're going to be tipped over and poured out this is a season listen it's like there's a grace to stand and to be filled and to overflow e put your hand on your mom and just say overflow 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 in Jesus name in Jesus name how many of you felt something come off like even your vision is lighter and brighter here's what I want to tell you number one I say this as an invitation all right fill your house fill your heart with the fullness of God meditating on who God is I don't want you to open this up and try to read it cover to cover unless the Lord leads you to do that, okay? I want you, when you look at this, when you open up this word, 
I want you to just spend time getting to know the Father, getting to know Jesus, asking Holy Spirit. One of the things we're going to teach you about probably in the new year is how to encounter the Lord through the revelation of His Word. But I encourage you, listen, this is not a season that's about what you read, it's about what you eat. Because you are what you eat. This is a season I encourage you, when we talk about filling your house, spend time in the Gospels. Spend time in the book of Acts and see yourself in those stories. Allow them to become the meditation of your heart. When the enemy tries to bring other things to your heart, your mind, that you would create worry or anxiety, take those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. It's t- it, Paul said that you don't only take ca- thoughts captive, but you punish those thoughts. You know how you punish a thought? By replacing it with the opposite of what you think. <laughs> Replace that bad thought with what God said and meditate on it, chew it, digest it until you become it. Again, by a show of hands, if you felt literally you felt something left whether your feet you felt a pressure leave you felt something mnemonically from the inside out there's a brightness on your eyes you're breathing better whatever it is right now if you felt a shift happen right now just wave both hands right now come on listen it's for freedom that he sets you free come on come on it's for freedom that he sets you free it's for freedom dave freedom now Live in that freedom. Live in that freedom. Allow the focus of your heart, the meditation of your life to be the goodness of God. Amen? I love you. We'll see you Friday night for young professionals. Don't miss this Saturday, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. The power of Thanksgiving. You don't want to miss this word. I believe it's going to be a life-changing day. And again, next Wednesday, we'll finish up our whole healing school and we'll have a big commissioning service, sending you out to do the works of God. Amen? If you still have children and King's kids, please go get them. Hallelujah.